So today we're going to look a little bit in Numos in action and specifically it's Package Manager IPS or uh, also known by us Package PKG. So who of you knows Ein Merck? Debian? The founder of Debian? <laughs> yeah. So uh, a little bit of history uh, as always with Numos talks. Uh, we go back to the Open Solaris days. Uh, Ian Murdoch got hired by Sun Microsystems back in the day uh, for several works. One including a replacement for the pretty annoying SVR4 SVR packaging. So for those of you who don't know SVR4 packaging, that's basically file-based packaging. So like it's a Debian package, but it's uh, another format and there is no internet in the packaging system at all. No internet repository like apt, it's basically DPK, DP, DPK, okay, DPKG. So no internet, you have to download it first and then install it and that with all the dependencies. So no dependency resolution whatsoever. Pretty annoying, uh, so they thought about the replacement and they hired the guy to which who did or invented apt to do something better. Um, the idea of IPS uh, is actually in evolvement of the original idea of apt. So it's not only a package manager, but it basically manages a so-called image. So a image, and basically what an image is, is we have Basically, it's the system, right? slash root for uh, those of you who are from Linux. Uh, however, IPS doesn't care where exactly that image is. That image can be in a subdirectory of your home folder, say. So you can basically install a complete operating system in a subdirectory of your home folder if you want to, via the packaging system. Um, of course, uh, Sun being Sun, they did not migrate the packages correctly uh, and we still have legacy packaging names, so we have this huge package called Sun VCS, which I hopefully have. So we basically have Sun VCS, which is basically the operating system, Solaris, or in our case, in Linux. So, but what is uh, a package in the sense of IPS? Basically, it's a so-called manifest, which is a text file describing the package and everything that's basically described, a few so-called actions. So if we look at the manifest of, say, Postfix, We see we have pretty straightforward uh, human readable um, format for metadata. So, what you see at the very beginning is like the action set. So, we have set, which is uh, package metadata like attributes or the headers, or in this case, uh, also variant. And down here is the first interesting one, this is group. The action group basically defines a group in the operating system. So when this action gets, this package gets installed, this action tells the IPS system, hey, create a group called host drop with the group ID 28. A little bit, yes, but um, I don't exactly know the reasons why we did that, but it turned out to be kind of the synchronizing point for all the distributions. So all the distributions and all the systems have the same UID for those users, and that helped out. It worked actually pretty good. Okay, and what would happen in case of a conflict? Uh, IPS will tell you, uh, you can't install that package. <laughs> <laughs> 
IPS is pretty much saying, okay, I'm checking everything for conflicts and everything, and if there is some conflict, it tells you, uh uh, won't do, I'm not working. Uh, and basically, you have your standard ones, ah, there's one. Uh, it's a little bit big in this font, but uh, this is an action for file. And here it gets interesting because what you see is you have each individual file named. So in a Debian package or in an RPM package, you have the files inside the package archive, which is usually a, a, a tar PSET, tar, G, tar archive. However, here you don't have the um, files directly attached to the package, however, they are named by their hash. Uh, it's a little bit legacy, uh, SHA1 hash, and uh, not 256, but uh, only one time, but still it uh, works out. And towards that file, you also have metadata. So you have also the C hash, which is uh, the object inside the ELF part. Or comp no, compressed hash, sorry. So the hash when it's compressed with GSIP. And to which group it belongs, owner, path, where to install it. And this kind of view you usually uh, ignore, but if you have dependencies, the dependencies get resolved on a per file level basis. So this pkg.depend bypass generate is basically where the dependency resolver fucked up and we needed to fix it. So this is a manual include from us during the, compi uh, during the compile stage of a package. So, so you work on, the, on this specification or on this package? Um, not on this. I think I worked on this package actually, yes. Oh, I yeah. uh, packaged postfix once. Some changes. Um, yeah. So including to basically what is an image, who of you knows what zones are? Okay, that's just a few. So zones are basically the OS level um, virtualization of uh, Illumos or Solaris in general. And if we just look at the zones where I'm currently running here, they are basically underneath their own ZFS data sets under slash zones slash code for example would be my coding VM or Jenkins VM and basically each zone is its own IPS image but again the, the host itself is an, it's, its own IPS image so they can be linked or they can be unlinked as well so if you have a linked zone or if you want to be very uh, or for some purpose you can go from the global zone, for example with the dash R, so we take our build zone which we were just in before, we have to append root because that's uh, standard for build env uh, boot environments, so they can have different snapshots. And we can make list, uh, yeah, this should be enough. Postfix, which should not be installed. Yes, should not be installed. Uh, I have, however, autocomp. It's my build machine, so it has autocomp, of course. So what I can basically say from the global or the uh, host, uh, host, the physical host, or the VM which hosts the zones, I can modify any image that is present or visible for. That for that machine without having to log into the zone itself. I can install packages, I can remove them, I can upgrade the whole zone just via the minus R switch, which is basically also a separate image. What you also can do if you, for example, want to distribute a whole OS as a tar, tar file, you can do a create image and then you can basically take a whole directory you have and create a completely new image and uh, IPS just installs the base OS into that. This gets also done during zone creation. However, as this is basically a gigabyte of data, this will take a little bit of time and I don't want to do that just now. Uh, 
and the whole definition as an image has also a few benefits when it comes to uh, system stability. So what we have in uh, IPS, we can also verify each and every file in the image at which state it is. So we can say, okay, uh, verify everything. So if we go for, uh, just verify the host quickly. So what it does now, it goes through every uh, manifest it can find, and through every file on the host file system, and compares the hashes and says, oh, okay, if the hashes has changed, the file got corrupted by, for example, a disk loss or um, a malicious uh, hacker or whatever. And verify is very cool because it actually doesn't fix or change anything. It just reports to the console how the status is at the moment, uh, including uh, also group and user changes of a file. So the metadata that is recorded in the actions gets also checked against the uh, files on the host system. So there is usually a few files which change group in slash var. Yeah, basically those. So here we have def set cons, which of course is a dynamically create a file during runtime and that has a different group than is recorded in the manifest. Which of course, well, uh, IPS doesn't really like. We have more cache cups which probably got modified by the cups program itself, so that's probably also an error in the manifest. Oh, we got the boot menu, which should be group sys, and CD boot, which apparently it has a little bit of corruption in it, it's a little bit of paper. So what we can do here, and as we see it's not really that important, it just changes root to sys, which in Solaris standards is equivalent to root. So we can say, hey, IPS, fix these problems you've just detected. And just once again does the whole uh, verification part because you can basically run the fix command without needing to run verify beforehand. And now it's also just going to do what it just what we just printed here and fix it. So it's again going to change CD boot or basically re-download CD boot if that package is still available. Ah, and it was. Yeah, so it basically just says, hey, I've verified, oh yeah, so basically it says, oh, I found five packages to fix, and I've created a backup of your running system in case I break something, which is very important, and then it just goes down, downloads everything it needs, so for example, if files are missing, it downloads them from the internet or the package repository, and basically it just fixes the whole system. Just like that. I have another question. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah? So how does a I mean how does it work that a package consists of several files? How are these split up? When I look at loader it's apparently two files that you need to download for it. Yeah. Why is it two files and so the package repository server uh, is actually a REST API. So if you go for the HTTP specification, you can basically just uh, make a GET request on slash file, blah blah blah, and the hash value, and you get that file as a single HTTP download. Okay. So package basically just does that. Oh, okay, so, so the package itself would be one file? Or the image of no. the package? The package ah, itself. So you really download all separate files yes. when you. Ah, okay. There is um, a trick. There is uh, you can basically get all the hash values, put them in a post request to the server, and you get a target set of all the files dynamically. If you want to speed up the connection, but most of the time downloading them individual was faster. Okay. So yeah, and 
that's also a little bit the, the cool things because when files have not changed between versions of packages, they don't need to be redownloaded. So, um, what do oh yeah, additionally, who in the Linux community has uh, played around with Java? Or had a system where you had multiple Java versions installed? Okay, you're a lucky guy. <laughs> 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 so, in the IPS system, we have a feature called mediators. So, let's for example say we have two different mail servers, and they both offer the SendMail interface. In this case, Postfix and SendMail. So, if I have them installed... Hi. So, we have a few interfaces defined here, for example, the interface Java. And this interface, basic, uh, basically a package can say, I'm uh, mediating also the interface Java, so slash user being Java, and I'm version 8 or I'm version 7, so we have two packages for that. And they are installable concurrently, so you can install both version 7 and 8. So the packages have to take care that that is possible. And the mediator system basically can um, tell us, okay, if I now have, what's not so important, oh yeah, GCC. Um, that's the host itself, the GCC is not important here. So I can say, I want to set mediator GCC to be version 6.0 which it doesn't like because it needs to be a big V not a small V oh, add minus the minus dots uh, I hate when I have to do this on the fly Basically what we have, we have two mediators for MTA, for the mail transport agent. We have mail wrapper, which is in itself a mediator. But we also have send mail, which provides the same uh, files, or in that case, symlinks in slash user bin. And when we say we want to modify it, of course, IPS is uh, happy enough to make a backup of our system with ZFS, so a ZFS snapshot. And basically just goes ahead and changes all the links in slash user bin. So if we look at slash user bin User bin mail queue. Okay. So now we see that mail queue links to lib smtp send mail mail queue. And if we change it back to mail record. It 
goes and does its thing. As you can see, it's not the fastest system. It has to do a few things every once in a while. Also updating the quick search databases. So, not perfect, but it does its job. <laughs> yeah, if we're waiting here, I can also tell a little bit about the history. So, the um, system itself got developed for Open Solaris. And basically, ne they never quite figured out who developed it exactly. They think the Chinese department did some part. So Sun at the time had a Chinese department which was basically corporate and they just crunched out codes on mass, it's like cheap work. They produced a ton of code. Um, so basically we have the Intel driver, which is completely custom made from scratch because we had some cheap they had some cheap Chinese workers that just crunched out the whole code and just read specifications and nothing else. Uh, we basically think that also happened to IPS. Uh, then Oracle bought it, and they also use it in Solaris 11. Um, but there is only a little bit of an exchange with patches every once in a while, so we have our own version now. So, so uh, yeah. it's, all, it's only uh, enabled on Solaris or on other systems that we got? If, well, BSD FreeBSD was thinking about it, but it's quite a huge work to port it. Mm -hmm. The thing is, it's still Python 2.6 or Python 2.7. Uh, it's a huge code base. So, as I said, the Chinese crunched out a whole bunch of code, and it's a huge code base, which can be reduced quite largely, actually. Mm -hmm. um, However, it also links quite in a few specific points into um, Solaris only libraries or libraries that are only available in Solaris, okay. like boot environments, which FreeBSD has now. But uh, yeah, it's it's quite tied into the system because that's also the feature to oh we can back up your system when yeah. we update your things and stuff and it's very nice tool to do that. But yeah, that's the price we pay for it. So now we see, uh, once we've changed the MTA back, it now doesn't link anymore to send mail mail queue, but instead to lib mail wrapper. And that's basically how the mediator system works. In Linux, I think there was some time the system update alternatives. That's basically the same included into, into the packaging. So no scripts, everything can be set via the actions, and everything can be modified that way. It's, for example, the man pages. So if you have a part of a package that may be optional, or in Debian which you want to split off into like developer headers and binaries and man pages, we have the facets. So if I basically want to throw out all main pages off my server, I can say change facet, main page, false. And all the main pages are gone. And lastly but not least, we have a very not much used feature called variants. I can only show it in a little bit in the... Actually, I can show you the variants installed. Um, these are basically um, versions of a package which are um, competing against each other. So on Debian they would be a uh, version Apache with npm prefork or without npm prefork. And you can only install one of them. Again with IPS you can do that in the same package. And you can annotate the binaries and say hey either that binary or that binary can be installed. However, it's a little bit redundant with mediators, because with mediators we can also say both are installed, please choose one of them, which usually works better for us. So, variants are only used for architecture, which is basically x68 or Spark, and if it's a global zone, or the global zone being the host a physical machine or VM, 
or a non-global zone, which is a zone running on a global system. And that's basically the basis of what we have. Uh, we also have a system called incorporations, which is basically just very hard-coded dependencies, so you can ensure that the machine is always at a certain patch level. Uh, more important in all the times now that we are rolling release, this gets a little bit into conflict with uh, our packaging release schedule and things. And it gets especially annoying when you want to build a package, I want a new version of it, want to install it from your local repository and package says, uh, no, already installed and hard dependency, go away. So it's usually the first fling that flows out on a build machine. So, um, I think we still have some time actually. Yeah. The next one's up to something, so we can show. I can also show you the development environment, which we have for the packages. For the packages. Mm -hmm. And also, question: I mean, You said you have a REST API via which you download all the single files. Yep. Um, then in the end, how much effort is it if you just want to build your very own package? And even without the repository, so, so you, I just say, okay, I want to build Postfix myself because mm -hmm. I like the standard package. How much effort would it be to put this properly into the system, to the package system? Um, that's how, that's where we uh, made scripts around for the build system. I'm coming to that just in a moment. Ah, okay. Uh, you had a question? Yeah, there? what's the state of reproducible, reproducible builds in Illumos. As long as the hash value of the file doesn't change, it's actually quite normal, but it's not really a thing we're working on actively. Okay. There's some, I think one distribution worked on it for some time, but it wasn't really necessary for us because we could also always verify with the package server if we had the correct version compared to the repository. And we do not have uh, mirrors or are big enough that decentralization uh, has come to play a part in. So, I will now show you a little bit about the build system and how basically how easy it is to make your own uh, roll your own version of a package. So, what we have, we have a Git repository on GitHub. Basically, open Indiana slash OE userland, which I defined here as upstream. And in this repository, we have uh, a lot of make files and scripts which you can use to basically build your packages. We have also a Vagran file, so if you have a Mac or a Linux machine with Vagrant installed, you can basically just run the Vagrant file and get a development machine for Open Indiana running there in the VM. So, what we have here, if we go to the components, that's where we have the uh, separate uh, package kind of the, uh, places. We should have post fix or Fine, fine. Fine, so nice. So, basically, what the package is in the development environment is a make file, a few patches, and a manifest which you define yourself, which then, which does not yet need to have the full metadata in it. We have basically then built a make scripts, which, uh, yeah. Which basically add all the required metadata in, through uh, tools into it. And what we also have is under x86 uh, repository. So under i i385 i385 sorry repo we have a local package repository. So you can have a REST API that is a package repository, but you can also have a file-based package repository where you can install files from or packages from. And if you develop, you basically uh, develop with this local repository, uh, publish your files to this local repository, 
test and try everything out until you're happy. And then you make a pull request on GitHub with your changes to the make files on manifests. And then people are going to comment and once the pull request gets merged, the Jenkins uh, basically does a build of the whole uh, system and rebuilds all the packages, including yours. So that's basically the process on how to get the package included. So yeah, we have a few newcomers. Uh, I'm afraid you're a little bit late to recapture everything. No problem. <laughs> so, Still, I uh, have the facets, I have the features, I have the images, fixing zones. Uh, oh, yeah, food environments. So, the feature we have in Illumos that is commonly used and is not yet present in other operating systems is a feature called boot environments. So, a boot environment is a bootable image of the running operating system based uh, on ZFS snapshots. So, no, it's not R, it's V. There we go. So, what you maybe know if you have used ZFS, you have your ZFS pools. Is that pools? And under there, as we are now in a zone, in my build zone, I have a data set called zones build root, which is the boot environment basics. And there I have separate data sets for each boot environment. And for each boot environment, they can also have snapshots and backups. So if I basically have made an error, I'm in boot environment 6, I've made an error and uh, I want to go to boot environment 7. I'm actually funny that I am at 6 and not at 9, which is the latest. So they get numbered upwards, so the one with the highest numbers. If you're not on that one and make an update, you basically just threw a little bit of work away. Because you worked in an image that you should have rebooted to upgrade to a new one. So what I can do is be NDM. ZBE for zone boot environment because we're in zone. Nine. Oh. Ah, that's why it didn't activate. It's not supported. Oh, yeah, it's a clone. There's a bug currently. When you clone a ZFS data set, it keeps its relation to its origin. And then you can't use boot environments in that zone. So you can't use boot environments in clones of zones but they're not blocked in the utility set because at some point I think you were able to do so, but not anymore. So, yeah, so much there. But basically, on the host, yeah, on the host we have a few backup boot environments. So I did some actions and it created me a few backups, which only require me a few kilobytes of space because they are basically snapshots or promoted snapshots to their own data set. Is it, uh, they all the exact same size, is that a coincidence? Or? No, we didn't do much. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the minimal, the minimal block size yeah. for the... Um, probably yes, especially when you change siblings, that kind of field. Because we changed the mediator two, three times. And that's why the backups exist, and that's probably exactly because we basically did the same action three times. So that's why they all the same size. Yeah, and that's that to IPS. Thank you for attending, and enjoy your work if you're joining in the Lumos.